Yeah, thank you so much, <clears throat> Dr. Benson. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Wendy Armstrong for the next uh, presentation. Dr. Armstrong is a professor of medicine and infectious diseases at Emory University, and she is <clears throat> the interim director, uh, division director, and executive medical director of the Ryan White funded Ponce de Leon and at the Grady Clinic at the Grady, which uh, serves about 7,000 people with HIV. And as past chair of the HIV Medicine Association, Dr. Armstrong is a passionate advocate uh, about developing and supporting innovative care models for patients uh, with significant barriers to care and about building the IDHIV workforce. So I welcome Dr. Armstrong, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Vadimo. And I am joined by Emily Evans, who's a fellow at Emory University in infectious disease, who is going to help me uh, with a case presentation today. So I'm excited to talk to you guys about pneumocystis pneumonia, what's old and what's new. Um, you've already seen a little bit about what's old. Um, neither uh, Dr. Evans nor I have any um, financial relationships to disclose. And at the end of this, I hope that you um, uh, feel some comfort with um, the diagnostic tests that are available to diagnose pneumocystis, um, can describe treatment and prevention strategies, and think about the differences between the presentation and course of pneumocystis in patients with and without HIV, as we see increasing uh, individuals with other uh, immunocompromising conditions presenting with pneumocystis. So here is our outline for today. And we are going to start with a case. And so I'm gonna ask Dr. Evans to uh, tell us about a person that she saw. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this is a case for my first month of fellowship and I'm presenting a 33 year old man with no previous past medical history, who's coming to the hospital with five days of shortness of breath. It initially was just exertional and then it progressed to be at rest. Um, it's associated with a dry cough and some chest pain over his sternum that's exacerbated by his cough. His review of systems is really otherwise unremarkable, um, and his past medical history is only notable for gonorrhea um, several years ago. He does smoke cigarettes and occasionally uses marijuana, but no other recreational drugs, and he reports that he's sexually active with women. Um, on his exam, he's afebrile, but tachycardic to the one teens. He is to Kipnik to 34, and he's slightly hypoxic to 86, that improves to 90% on two liters. Um, he is thin, but non-toxic appearing, although his increased work of breathing is notable. Um, on his oral exam, he does have some thrush. And as I said, he's he was tachycardic, but and to Kipnik. Um, his baseline labs were largely unremarkable with a weight count of 7.4 um, and a pretty normal CMP. His LDH was elevated to 625, but his quad screen was negative and nearly positive was his HIV test um, and further respiratory tests were pending. Um, his chest x-ray at admission was normal. Um, and so uh, after our initial studies, we obtained a CT of his chest that you can see there on the screen. Um, it's notable for some ground glass opacities that was raising our concern for pneumocystis as well as some other opportunistic infections. Um, we sent a pneumocystis PCR, which was positive. However, also in that workup included a Legionella antigen, histoantigen, crypto, um, as well as a multiplex PCR panel. As far as his HIV goes, his CD4 was 50 and his viral load was almost 4 million. All right, so with that backdrop, uh, that case of a gentleman presenting with pneumocystis and newly diagnosed HIV, let's talk about pneumocystis in detail. So you already heard and saw this um, exact um, report uh, of pneumocystis pneumonia um, in, now more than 40 years ago. Uh, it was not on the front page, it was buried in the back page of that uh, uh, volume of the MMWR. But it, again, brought pneumocystis to light. Prior to that, pneumocystis was really a pathogen most um, known for causing pneumonia in uh, young, young children. And, uh, um, and suddenly it was being seen in a different population. Well, we know what happens from there. Um, and we also know there's been a name change. So pneumocystis is caused by the organism pneumocystis gyrovecchiae in humans. It's a fungus, and we're going to talk about that, not a parasite, as was originally thought. And because it can't be cultured, there has been a lot of challenge with making the diagnosis, figuring the diagnostic tests, thinking about how to investigate resistance, and basically investigating the organism by itself. 
And so it was learned after some time that in fact, the original organism Pneumocystis carinii was actually the rat pathogen and Pneumocystis gerevechiae is the pathogen that we see in, um, in humans. At that point, um, the, the disease was already called Pneumocystis pneumonia, PCP, or Pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. Uh, they changed that to be Pneumocystis pneumonia, as you can see. So PCP remains a correct um, abbreviation, but many people have adopted PJP um, for Pneumocystis gerevechiae pneumonia, and either are correct. The problem is, is that um, our knowledge of pneumocystis has in really large part been stuck in 20 years ago. And so treatment and prevention are based on increasingly old data and it frankly needs to be updated. So what I'm gonna show you today, I'll show you what is new, but there's a lot that's not new and I'll show you that as well. So first, um, a little bit about the organism itself. Again, I told you everybody thought it was a parasite initially. That's because it exists in two forms that are common in parasites, trophozoites and cysts. And you can see on the right, a silver stain from lung of the cysts from pneumocystis. Um, and you can see that um, those cell walls light up nice and bright. Well, this cyst form is the form that's responsible for airborne transmission um, that people inhale. But once the cyst form enters the human, it becomes the growth form, the trophozoite. And that form actually is the predominant uh, uh, form of the organism in the human lung, for example. Um, it is much more difficult to detect because it doesn't have this nice thick cell wall and it's much, much, much smaller than the cyst form um, that you can see there. And so that is um, one of the challenges that we can discuss. So a little bit more though about the cell wall. I told you that it's a fungus and part of the, the uh, way that that was sorted out was really taking a close look at the cell wall. And on the top here, you can see the candida cell wall and on the bottom, you can see the pneumocystis cell wall. And there's two really important observations to make. The first is that the um, lipid that's in the lipid bilayer um, in um, Canada is ergosterol. That's the target of azoles and terbenafine and why those drugs work against it. But in pneumocystis, there's cholesterol there. And so um, azoles and terbenafine have no activity against pneumocystis. And so that's one important difference. An important similarity, though, is the purple um, that you can see in both these cell walls. That's the beta-1,3 glucan or the beta-D glucan that um, we test, um, that is a test. And, um, and, uh, and that, again, helps create this thick cell wall that we see on the staining of the cysts. Um, so uh, when we think about who gets pneumocystis, we think about patients with HIV, and we think about um, uh, uh, T-cell mediated, mediated immunity, and we think about CD4 counts less than 200. On the right is old data from untreated HIV, but you can see that, and you can see that the vast majority of cases occur with a CD4 count under 200, but it is not exclusive to CD4 counts under 200. That's where we recommend prophylaxis, certainly, but it's not exclusive. And in fact, other forms of immunity are important as well. And that's become important to acknowledge as we look at individuals not living with HIV, but with other um, uh, reasons to be immunocompromised and their risk for getting pneumocystis. In fact, in addition to T cells, which activate host macrophages as part of the immune defense, B cells are also critical. And if you deplete mice of their B cells, their risk of pneumocystis is similar to that of T cell deficient mice. So um, the macrophages are important, the innate immune response, the adaptive immune response, T and B cells. And so, um, so that's an important piece to remember. The organism is ubiquitous in the environment. Nearly everyone is exposed by age four. I mentioned it was a cause of childhood pneumonia. And some of us are colonized with pneumocystis, not everyone, but some of us. And so there was a lot of question in the field and a lot of thought that in fact, it was this colonization state that led to reactivation. That's the model for so many different um, processes that we see in HIV and late stage HIV, like toxoplasmosis, for example. And so it was thought that most of pneumocystis was reactivation disease. But we've actually learned that new infection plays an important role, new infection from the environment. And in fact, that there can be person to person spread. And that's been discovered um, due to outbreaks in uh, facilities and hospital facilities and so on with immunocompromised wards. Um, that said, uh, the degree or the importance of this or the factors that are at play are not totally understood. And there is no recommendation for infection control procedures in hospitalized patients with pneumocystis. But again, both forms are uh, important mechanisms of infection. How do patients present? Well, you heard about it in the case that Dr. Evans just presented. 
uh, often with fever and fatigue. These are patients with HIV, often with fever and fatigue, the subacute onset of progressive shortness of breath with dyspnea on exertion and a non-productive cough. Extra pulmonary disease can occur. We used to see it in the old days, particularly with um, aerosolized pentamity and prophylaxis. But boy, I haven't seen a case in decades at this point, and it's quite rare. On exam, the uh, patient with HIV often has um, signs on examination that suggest late stage HIV. This may include thrush or seborrheic dermatitis or wasting. The lung exam may reveal some crackles, but they may be absent. This is a classic atypical or pneumonia or interstitial lung disease where um, the um, chest examination is often much less significant than the actual findings on the x-ray. Many patients, like Dr. Evans's patients, co patient, complain of chest pain and a tightness in the chest. And I think a, um, uh, the test of uh, doing a, an ambulatory pulse oximeter and looking for desaturation is one of those very cheap, very easy, and absolute gold tests that uh, I use often in the clinic um, to think of when I'm worried about pneumocystis. One pearl, again, um, if you see a non-productive cough in a patient with thrush that doesn't have another good reason for thrush, isn't on you know inhaled steroids, for example, it's PCP until proven otherwise. So here's the imaging. Um, the chest X-ray um, on the left, you can see a diffuse interstitial infiltrate. Often you can see a bat wing infiltrate, um, but um, uh, the chest X-ray can easily be completely normal as it was again in the case you just heard. It can be cystic, it can have nodules, um, and but importantly, there can also be spontaneous pneumothorax. And when you see that, um, think about pneumocystis every time. On the chest CT, even with a normal chest X-ray, um, you uh, will often see ground glass. And again, I find this to be incredibly helpful um, and, uh, and uh, will um, CT uh, patients in whom I have concerns. How about diagnostics? Well, there are some okay, not great serologic tests, and then certainly the gold standard are respiratory tests. And so let's talk about both of those. In the serologic test, a lot of people talk about first is the LDH, the lactate dehydrogenase. I personally don't put a lot of stock in this lab because it, um, an inflamed lung will show an elevated LDH. And so it has very poor sensitivity and specificity. And to me, tells me that there's lung disease. But again, it is something that might help, particularly in somebody with a potentially normal uh, X-ray and a cough. What a lot of people are using today is beta glucan testing. Um, which um, tests again, um, which uh, tests for fungi with beta glucan in the, in the cell wall. So many things can cause a positive, including candidal species in some molds, but, um, but pneumocystis um, gives you a positive beta glucan as well. And it's very, very high often in pneumocystis disease. Again, not very specific, but if it is normal, um, it is great for ruling out pneumocystis pneumonia. The problem is, is that most labs don't run it in-house and turnaround time can be a factor and you may need to make your decisions or do your diagnostic testing long before you'll get the beta glucan back. Others run it in-house and it's pretty quick. If you're looking for more specific testing, particularly on the respiratory side, then the next question you have to ask yourself is what specimen am I going to obtain? In the old days, again, we did a lot of induced sputums. And the key with an induced sputum is when the respiratory tech um, uh, put some aerosolized saline to agitate in the pharynx and cause a deep cough that then is collected with the sputum collected. It, the, um, how good an induced sputum is depends completely on the operator. And as people have gotten out of practice of doing this or in places where there's a low volume, induced sputums are really not very good at all. The advantage is it is non-invasive. Uh, it has a uh, high specificity if you find the pathogen um, and you, uh, but lower sensitivity. A better test is a bronco, bronco alveolar lavage um, where you can get a great sample. It is invasive, but it has a higher specificity and sensitivity than induced sputum. Transbronchial biopsies give you the opportunity to obtain pathology. They add very, very little to a BAL for pneumocystis. If you're gonna, if you're gonna see it on a BAL, if you're gonna see it on a transbronchial biopsy. The nice thing though, is that it could reveal other pathogens that are present. And so that can give you more information if there is diagnostic uncertainty. There are um, serum, uh, specific serum tests um, like pneumocystis PCR and so on in the serum that are under investigation, but not ready for prime time. 
Okay, once you have your specimen, what do you do with it? Well, you can stain it with cytology. Um, it's nice because the um, uh, cytology stain will stain, will stain positive well into the start of your treatment course. And so you don't have to get the specimen. Uh, you could start therapy and then get your specimen a few days later, like after the weekend is over, for example, and it will still be present. Pneumocystis will still be visible. It does require expertise. And the problem is that the stains we use most often, the silver stain and calcifor white only stain cysts. And so you only see the cyst form, which I told you is the less common form. The um, differences in pneumocystis burden therefore affect results. And that's important in particular when we talk about the non-HIV um, population with pneumocystis. Similarly, you can use immunofluorescence. It does stain both the tropes and cysts and is more sensitive than cytology, but with the same caveats. And finally, many are using PCR, which is very sensitive. And there are investigations to look at this on other specimen types like uh, um, nasopharyngeal swabs and tracheal aspirates. It may be overly sensitive. Um, we don't know uh, a cutoff that tells us colonization versus disease. So there is um, clinical judgment that needs to come into play. I've mentioned a couple times that there are differences between persons with HIV and persons without. Um, I already told you the presentation in people with HIV that's subacute. Um, the organism burden is very high, um, and therefore um, the um, organism is usually easy, easily visualized if you get a good sample and quantitative PCR values are high. On the other hand, those without HIV often present acutely and often with more severe disease. It is a lower organism burden. Presumably there's more of an inflammatory response, maybe. Um, so it is harder to diagnose um, with cytology or immunofluorescence and PCR can get confusing about colonization and whether there's a, and you don't want to anchor too early on the wrong diagnosis. The other thing is in HIV, we have very established protocols and, uh, and recommendations for prophylaxis. Um, not true in patients without HIV and those um, uh, protocols are less um, regularly followed. At the end of the day, um, in persons with HIV, the mortality rate is 10 to 30%. It's higher in persons without HIV, 20 to 50%. Is that because of later recognition? Is that because of the pathology? I don't know. Treatment, as we know, the first line therapy is trimeth sulfamethoxazole, um, either IV, which is usually what I use in hypoxic patients um, if it's not on shortage, or two double strength POTID tablets. If there is severe disease, this is the gold standard. And so if there is a sulfa allergy, I would consider desensitization. If there's mild to moderate disease, I wouldn't go to that level. And because there are perfectly great second line agents, there are also second line agents for severe disease. The thing about treating pneumocystis that's hard is that improvement can take time. And I find myself often having to take my own pulse um, every time I see a patient that's not improving to sort of to remind myself to have patience. So improvement can take two, three, four, five, six days, seven days, even some are even later than that. However, if there's no improvement after about five to seven days, uh, you have to start re-examining um, your thoughts. Worry about co-infection, other processes, worry about the development of iris or inflammatory disease, depending on when ART was started. I worry a lot about the development of fibrotic disease, which uh, really can then be um, a lifelong, um, uh, cause lifelong morbidity. Um, and I worry less, honestly, if somebody is on trimeth sulfa about non-response to trimeth sulfa. It's a good drug. Yes, there is um, some molecular evidence of um, resistance, but there's never been clear evidence that even in those cases that the drug fails. That said, I will often uh, uh, think about adding another drug, but, uh, but uh, make sure you think through all those other options as well. Okay, what about second line agents? Well, if it's mild to moderate disease um, and the patient's not hospitalized, I think uh, the choices include PO atovaquone. Um, this requires a um, fatty meal to absorb. So it's important that they are, the patient is eating and, and can absorb. Um, clindamycin primaquin um, or dapsone trimethoprim. Clindapromaquin, uh, if patients are G6PD deficient, this is contraindicated similarly with dapsone trimethoprim. And I'll say trimethoprim alone without the sulfa is really hard to find in drugstores. And so um, I reach for that one relatively infrequently. In more um, in sicker patients that are moderate to severe and hospitalized, and I don't want to desensitize to Bactrim, um, I'll choose clindamycin primaquin almost every time. 
um, unless there's G6PD deficiency. I frankly rarely reach these days for IV pentamidine. Um, uh, it is it has significant um, uh, uh, adverse effects that require, I think, experience with this drug and watching it closely um, uh, in order to not run into trouble. You know, there's a lot of questions about whether or not echinocandins have any role. And honestly, I don't know the answer. What I do know is that um, it is active only against the cyst form because only the cyst form has that wall with the beta glucan. And that's not the form that's causing most of the disease in most patients. Again, it's not active against the trophozoites. I would never, ever, ever, ever consider using this as monotherapy. I'm not sure as an adjunctive agent if it has a role or not. We do treat patients living with HIV with adjunctive corticosteroids for more severe disease if their PaO2 is less than 70 or an AA gradient over 35. This was established in 1990 when there were three competing papers at the same time that were published um, with three different um, protocols for giving steroids and all of them showed a significant decrease in respiratory failure and in death versus no steroids. The reason that we picked the taper that you see written there today is because it appeared in the paper that was that had the largest N number of patients. And, um, and so that is actually the arbitrary reason that this is the steroid taper that we tend to recommend. So there's no perfect magic to it, but it is starting out with an 80 milligram uh, prednisone equivalent uh, uh, and tapering from there over the three week course of therapy. There is an increased risk of HSV in these patients with the steroids, but otherwise there was no significant increased risk in other opportunistic infections. Now in patients without HIV, the question of adjunctive corticosteroids is an active one. There are studies in mild to moderate disease that have not shown a benefit, just as it would probably not show benefit in patients with HIV that don't meet the um, oxygenation criteria. There have been many meta-analyses, retrospective studies, prospective studies, and they have had variable results about whether there is benefit, no benefit, but no harm or harm um, with respect to corticosteroids. And so this is an area where a randomized control trial is urgently, urgently needed. Um, there is one that I had uh, understood was underway, but um, searching it, uh, it appears to potentially be stalled. Um, and so here we, we desperately need data. What about prophylaxis? So first-line therapy is once again trimethylsulfa once daily, which also gives you active prophylaxis against toxoplasmosis. Um, uh, Second-line therapy include different dosing schedules of trimethylsulfa three times a week or different strengths, single strength daily. Um, Dapsone, if there's not G6PD deficiency, or etobicone uh, once daily, um, which is uh, the most expensive of those four regimens by far. Um, in addition, uh, uh, one can give aerosolized pentamidine, pentamidine once monthly. You have to do it with this particular nebulizer that I have listed. Um, but it is um, effective, particularly for um, patients who may have trouble with the daily medication um, or uh, in whom um, there are other contraindications um, with rash or other things. You know, recently I've been asked this question um, on, in the non-HIV patient population about the use of IV pentamidine for prophylaxis uh, uh, once monthly, which I had completely not heard about until about a year ago. There is data um, in stem cell transplant uh, children, more robust, there's more robust data there than adults. Uh, I have a healthy respect for IV pentamidine, but and so this is um, not something that I've um, proceeded to use, um, but I, in case you hear about it, um, this um, there is some emerging data. What about indications for prophylaxis? Um, well, again, in HIV is very clear, very established. C4 count less than 200 or a percent less than 14. In patients without HIV, it is less established. The one I think that is most frequently followed is a prednisone dose over 20 milligrams for more than four weeks, although I see tons of patients on steroids um, that do not get prophylaxis. Generally, in the lung transplant population, it's lifelong. In other solid organ transplants, it's quite variable um, and usually um, site-dependent. Stem cell transplant patients will often get six months unless there's ongoing immunosuppression. Um, CAR T-cell recipients, similarly. There are a variety of immunosuppressants, of uh, immunomodulators, alemtuzumab, thymoglobulin, and ibrutinib um, come in particular to mind where pneumocystis prophylaxis is not uncommon. Ibrutinib is particularly closely linked to pneumocystis. 
And then granulomatous polyangiitis during induction therapy will often get pneumocystis prophylaxis. In HIV, we again talk about when to discontinue primary prophylaxis. That's usually when those cell counts have been above 200, CD4 counts for more than three months. There is data that suggests that someone with viral load suppression for up to six months and a CD4 over 100 can also stop. And I will say I do this in some settings. In settings where people have been stable for ages and their CD4 count never is coming up above 100, in folks who have real problems with Bactrim um, or whatever their prophylactic regimen is. Um, so there are limited times when I will stop um, early if someone is consistently virologically suppressed. As far as secondary prophylaxis, the uh, recommendations are the same, except always pay attention to what the CD4 count was when that patient got their pneumocystis infection. If it was above 200, I would not stop um, uh, secondary prophylaxis until um, they were significantly more um, uh, uh, immuno uh, or less immunosuppressed, or I might continue it for, for a very, very, very long time. All right, so I want to jump back to the patient that we heard about who had um, uh, not a usual hospital course. So Dr. Evans. Sure. So getting back to our case, um, just to remind everybody, he was admitted and initially before the pneumocystis PCR came back positive, we started him empirically on ceftriaxone and doxy for a community acquired pneumonia. Um, he then, when it came back positive, we switched him to Bactrim and prednisone as he was meeting the hypoxia criteria. Um, however, on day three, he was admitted to the ICU for his for worsening hypoxia and his work of breathing. Um, Fortunately, he was only there for a few days, and uh, by day five, he was transferred out of the ICU, still on oxygen. And by day eight, we were starting him on his ART of Victarvi. Um, he was doing well and was almost ready for discharge until he um, acutely deteriorated over the course of one to two days, um, requiring much more oxygen, was on 10 liters and 15 liters. Um, he also had re uh, recurrent fevers and had to be transferred back to the ICU and ultimately intubated. Um, on his repeat diagnostic evaluation, we rescanned him and found worsening ground glass opacities on his CT chest. We repeated a quad screen looking for hospital transmission of viral infections, um, which was negative as well as the multiplex PCR again. Um, his respiratory cultures were negative um, and his pneumocystis PCR was still positive. Um, his viral load had decreased uh, substantially and was down to 3,500, down from 4 million before. Um, and so given that we had concern about immune reconstitution and inflammatory syndrome in this patient who had rapidly decreased viral load and uh, worsened pneumonitis, we increased his prednisone back up to 40 of EID, total dose of 80. Um, and then we added on empiric broad spectrum antibiotics while we were waiting for his repeat res respiratory cultures. Um, when he ultimately declined needing intubation, we uh, ended up pulse dosing him with a gram of methylpred. Um, and fortunately, he was extubated two days after that. Um, we were excited and eventually were tapering his steroids back down to 60. Um, however, with the decrease in steroids, he again developed fevers and his breathing got a little bit more uncomfortable. And so we had to re-increase the steroids and uh, slow, more slowly taper them off. And um, eventually he recovered and I have been seeing him in clinic. So this raises an interesting question about immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome and pneumocystis pneumonia. You know, iris has been reported with many organisms, mycobacterial disease and um, cryptococcal disease sort of leading the pack. Um, but, uh, and it has been reported with pneumocystis, but it's much less common than with other organisms in older series. There are some data that support increased rates of iris in the INSTE era where you can have these dramatic, um, you know, uh, four or five log reductions in uh, viral load rapidly. But a recent RCT in, um, in the African continent did not confirm this, the reality trial. Um, importantly, there are no data that support delaying ART in the setting of pneumocystis, either pre or post uh, INSTE uh, introduction. So um, I think this uh, case was a clear case of iris with pneumocystis, but the best treatment regimens remain unknown. Um, uh, in this case, um, very high dose steroids were tried. Um, there's been discussion about other immunomodulators, um, uh, uh, not so high dose steroids, and the best time to start ART remains unknown, but for now, I would not delay. 
I will say though, as a postscript there, this is a conversation that a lot of us in the South have been ha having where we are suddenly seeing um, much more severe iris than we have seen before. Um, and these are in places that have significant rates of opportunistic infections at baseline. Um, we've had several patients with pneumocystis on ECMO um, and, uh, and uh, uh, really uh, have been struggling in, in a number of ways. So I, we are curious if others are noticing this as we try to study cases. And so that's my plea um, for us to uh, help think about this and try and understand things better. And so with that, I will stop and turn it uh, back over to our moderators. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Armstrong and Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Evans for a wonderful presentation. And I think Dr. Armstrong just demonstrated live her passion for building the ID HIV workforce with the introduction of Dr. Evans in this presentation. So thank you very much. And uh, still we'll welcome additional questions for now. This is what I have, uh, a question that asks, what about the unreliability? of pulse oximetry in patients with darker skin? Any comments? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's an important point um, and one that we must keep in mind. I think if I'm in, uh, in my clinic, um, the majority of patients that I see are black or brown. And, um, and so if I see a patient desaturate on um, a pulse oximeter, that's significant to me. If there is not desaturation, I have to raise the question in my head, am I missing it because of this issue? And again, it's about clinical judgment and um, using all the different um, uh, uh, factors and things that you can think about, uh, all the different data that you have to, to, to make a decision. I don't usually go for a, a blood gas in clinic, I will say, which would sort that out. But again, um, clinical judgment, I think, uh, um, does it. I will say that in people with more, with that are, um, um, struggling, I will say that more often than not, even with darker skin, I do see a uh, desaturation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question is, in your practice, have you ever used uh, trametoprene sulfate desensitization? Any comments about that? Yeah, no, I sure have. Um, and I've used it in both settings. I've used uh, desensitized in the hospital with IV Bactrim, and that's an easier setting, right? Because um, you know, you've got uh, 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 nurses, you presumably have severe uh, pneumocystis. And so um, there's a, you're often in a highly monitored setting and, and so on and so forth and pharmacy support. In the clinic, um, and I, I, I haven't done this as much recently to be fair, um, but um, uh, we had a protocol um, that uh, we would use with um, slowly increasing doses of oral Bactrim that we could accomplish over the course of a morning in clinic. Um, and it was uh, honestly extremely successful. Clearly, we never tried to desensitize a patient with an, uh, a Stevens-Johnson or anything, a dress or anything that suggested a severe reaction. Um, yeah. But, um, but the, there, there are published um, desensitization protocols for the outpatient setting, and they were very easy and very successful. Excellent. And uh, next question, I think inspired by your uh, presentation of an iris uh, case is, could the increased iris be related to COVID or priming from prior vaccination and robust inflammatory response? It's a good question. And, you know, I honestly don't know the answer. Um, uh, we have seen um, iris in some patients who have also had, and so this is what we think is iris in some patients who have also had COVID. So obviously that makes things challenging. Uh, that had been recent or prior, but um, but uh, and again, who knows now? Um, uh, in you know, because most of our patients have had some level of vaccination, but many haven't. But they have probably had natural disease at this point. That said, we're seeing pulmonary types of iris, but we're seeing iris into other things as well. Um, and uh, and again, I'm just really fascinated because I've been interested in iris for a long, long decades. And this is distinctly different than anything hmm. um, that we've experienced before. Hmm. Yeah, I must also say that being in the South uh, here in Dallas, we see probably a lot more OIs than others uh, uh, report seeing. And so yes. you need to stay vigilant. And so the next question is about the recall. So 
you said something like if a person has thrush and that 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 it's pjp until proven otherwise can you please repeat that line <laughs> i believe that i said thrush in a non-productive cough uh, okay uh, you know, there, one can imagine a lot of non-productive coughs from yeah. their COVID they just had but uh um, but uh, in somebody, again, that in non-productive cough that you are concerned um, has a, a deeper respiratory infection, um, uh, you, you have to think about pneumocystis. You just have to. The thrush is the clue to the diminished immunity, again, in the absence of another obvious risk factor for thrush. So this is guilt by association, you say? Yes, that's exactly okay. correct. It's guilt by association. <laughs> it is not linked in any other way than thrush being the, the immunosuppression um, uh, clue. Excellent. Um, yeah, somebody just made a comment about a recent severe case uh, of uh, Aris, uh, uh, PGP who succumbed in the ICU. And and so, yes, index of suspicion is necessary. Um, I do not have other questions that uh, uh, came uh, to me thus far, but I also wanted to add, add one. I mean, you mentioned uh, about this uh, discontinuation of uh, prophylaxis in people with either secondary immunologic failure or who just didn't uh, primary immunologic failure. Now, we struggle with that sometimes because like like you alluded to, the data is is iffy and, and it's a question that, that remains more and more. Some people say somebody is biologically suppressed forever. They rarely ever get PJP and I don't know what the basis uh, of that is, do you have any scared to speculate? Even when your CD4 count is still really low, you just I don't. Think that, <laughs> um, I, I think that um, that suppressing viral load drops immune activation. Mm -hmm. It leads to so much less, um, uh, therefore, immune senescence. Yeah. That I think the immune system works better than the CD4 count may suggest. Um, and so I think that change alone with the, you know, uh, decreasing um, uh, activation and induced cell death uh, makes the difference, even again, even if the C4 count doesn't budge. So I would say our decades long uh, attitude of just counting cells, it probably yeah. a little misinformed. <laughs> I agree 100%. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Any other questions? Um, I don't. So, See. Roger, there's a couple that I have. I'm not oh. sure if you saw the pre-questions. Oh. The, there's a couple that came in before the program that okay, uh, sorry. maybe I can uh, okay. throw can out there. Them? Yes. <laughs> so one of them, I think you covered much of this, but um, one question in a patient with a CD4 count of less than 200, how long do you continue Bactrim for prophylaxis once the CD4 count is above 200? I think you did cover that in your discussion, but the follow-up question to that was, is it different for newly diagnosed versus old infection with uh, pneumocystis? So I'm not quite sure I'm fully understanding the question, but um, are there differences that would might make you do something different with OI prophylaxis if it was a newly diagnosed pneumocystis versus a uh, recurrent pneumocystis? Uh, so I guess um, the questioner is asking if it's um, pri primary or secondary prophylaxis for pneumocystis disease that was recent or a long time ago. Uh, yeah, well, think... it, it's a little hard because I we don't have the person here. Maybe they can elucidate later. But I think what they're asking is how long you continue um, OI prophylaxis once the CD4 count is above 200. Is this different for someone with newly diagnosed HIV versus longstanding HIV? Uh... It is not different in that um, setting. What I, I, you know, if the question is, you know, for example, with MAC, there, you know, if you're treating disease, there, you know, there's a duration um, that you may continue after um, uh, after counts come up, and you're probably going to cover that, Dr. Benson. But uh, you know, for pneumocystis, um, what if you have as long as disease as pneumocystis presented with a CD4 count under 200, and it is fully treated for three weeks. 
Um, I, you know, and now the person started their antiretroviral therapy and they are above that threshold rapidly. Um, I don't mind stopping fairly quickly their pneumocystis prophylaxis um, versus somebody who's been um, uh, where it was either more remote or they've had HIV for longer. To me, the key question is, why did they get pneumocystis when they did? Um, so if it's somebody with treated HIV, virally suppressed, who suddenly gets pneumocystis, even though their CD4 count is stuck at 100 or 150, that person's going to make me a little bit more nervous. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, I think the as long as the pneumocystis occurred with a CD4 less than 200 or percent less than 14, um, I think once they reach those thresholds um, and are virally, virally suppressed for three to six months, you can stop. Great. And there were there are a number of questions um, from the uh, pre-questions from the audience about the cost of some of the medications and some of the things that you mentioned. Does cost get taken into account when you decide what you're going to use for treatment of pneumocystis or prophylaxis of pneumocystis? So I always think it's a hard balance between thinking about cost um, and patient care because we all want the best for our patients. In this case, I actually think that they work really well together because the expensive product is atovaquone. Um, and I, I don't love atovaquone. It's the easiest thing to reach off the shelf and give a patient. Patients generally hate the taste. They have to eat to get a decent level and it's not the gold standard. And so um, I am a Bactrim or Dapsone person, which are both cheap, um, unless there is a real indication to do otherwise. And how about the cost of pyrimethamine? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's like a red flag to all of us these days. Yes, pyrimethamine. Um, it is It is devastating to me that bringing this out into the open and having congressional hearings on pyrimethamine did not reduce the cost of pyrimethamine after it was artificially increased. Um, it does, unfortunately, influence things because hospitals often don't stock pyrimethamine at the cost at this point. And so in those cases, I do think it is tough and you, we may have to find, one may have to find um, other options. But of course, you're only using pyrimethamine for pneumocystis if you are prophylaxing and with dapsone pyrimethamine to get the toxo as well. Primaquin, which is what goes with Plinda, is not terribly expensive. Yeah. And the pyrimethamine question will come up again when you're talking about toxo and your your case presentations, Roger. So, okay, yes, I think that was all of the uh, questions. Um, I think you're going to turn it over to me, Roger, for our next speaker. Yes, so, please. <laughs> uh, all right. So, 